This week, we're talking about the helmet of salvation. And I've got Ben here with me. He's a firefighter. And Ben, obviously, when you're going into a fire, you're, you're not going into it with, you know, a beanie on or just a ball cap turned backwards. You, you have a helmet and it's there for a reason. So tell me a little bit about the role your helmet plays as you're going in to fight a fire. The helmet's kind of, it's, it's the badge of honor for firefighters in general. I mean, that's the piece that goes around with them from, from everything. And so it tells a lot of stories. It tells where they've been at. But first and foremost, it protects your brain. It protects what you're thinking and being able to cognitively think about what you're doing to move forward in that fire so that you can not only save yourself, but save lives if lives are at bay. So that helmet, if you know, as a building or structure or whatever might start to collapse or you know, you're fighting a grass fire and trees are falling, that helmet, I mean, it, it can be your salvation. It can help save you if, if stuff starts to start crumble, crumbling around you, right? Yeah, and you know, we've had many instances that guys have turned helmets in and had to get new helmets because of just that. I mean, it's protected and it's done its job. How much, how much pressure can your helmet feel like it can be hit? How much, how much pressure can it? I'm glad sustain? I can't tell you. <laughs> well, good morning. Man, I'm so honored to be with you wherever you are with us today at one of our physical campuses, north or south, or if you're part of our online family. If you will, if you don't mind, get your Bible and turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter six, if you don't happen to have a Bible with you, you can grab one underneath the chair in front of you or underneath your chair if you're at one of our physical locations. There's a book icon at our online campus. We encourage you to turn there. We're on page 979 in the black colored Bibles in our, at our physical campuses. Now, as you turn to the text, I want to ask you a question. I feel like the Spirit of God posed to me this week. And I ask you to really seriously consider it, but I want you to know ahead of time, I'm not asking it to, to provoke some sort of weird sense of guilt or to feel bad about ourselves. I really feel like the Spirit of God's wanting to take us somewhere. So I'd ask you to really consider and be honest. When you look at your day-to-day -day life, we're not talking about Sunday, we're not talking about plus Thursday when you go to church, we're talking about like Monday, Wednesday, how often in a given day do you think about God? Now, again, I'm not saying that just to make us feel guilty, make us feel bad. There's these, this odd thought in religion that if I feel guilty, somehow I've done something with what I've heard. We're not doing that. I'm asking a very practical question. How often in a given day do we think about God? Because I begin to wonder about something. Is something so seemingly innocuous as distraction? So seemingly harmless as lack of focus, is it possibly a scheme of the enemy meant to destroy us? And before you dismiss me, I want you to look at the 16th verse of Ephesians chapter six. In all circumstances, say all. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation. Now, of all the various pieces of equipment that a first century Roman soldier would have, we understand helmets, do we not? I mean, most of us have never run into a blazing furnace, but even if we've never fought a fire, we understand, we get how important a helmet would be to a fighter fighter. Shoot, we have helmets for everything now. When I was a kid, you had a helmet for nothing, right? I mean, we rode our bikes, we rode our skateboards, we rode our um, rollerblades, things such as that. There's no, I, I wonder how we survived in days gone by, to be honest with you. But I do understand why we need a helmet. In West Texas, when we hear helmet, we hear what? Football, baby. I mean, we are right in the center of Texas football country. Come on, 1st of August. We're all beginning to think just a few more weeks, the lights of Friday night are about to shine, and if you play football, you wear a helmet. Come on. Chris, Chris, call him. Call him. Call him. You're in the game. Come on. Hey, 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 son, come here, come here. Where are you going? You don't, you don't want me to go in, Coach? You don't want a helmet? Where's your helmet? Uh, go get it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You see my helmet, man? Find your helmet, son. Yeah, what you looking for, Water Boy? Uh -huh. Hey, let me get this real quick. No Look way. Find your helmet, man. Come on, come on. Oh, man. My goodness gracious. Bobby. Water Boy, you can't come out here with no helmet, man. Yeah, yeah. You see my helmet right here? I can still go in. Uh, 28 sweet. 28 sweet. Chris, you don't know where your helmet is. <laughs> what are you thinking? Since when did you put your helmet? Right there, a second ago. Well, it ain't there. You do not know that you play the game with a helmet on? Then shut your head right now. 
And every dude that tried playing football in junior high had like a post-traumatic flashback right there. And we all got yelled at by a coach. I mean, come on. We all know you can't play football without a helmet on. Why? We've learned over the course of the past decades how imperative, how vital it is to protect the brain. Our ability to think is tied to the health of our brains. But it's not just when it comes to the physical brain that it's important. In the war against the enemy, the way in which we think is of utmost importance. In the passage that we've been reading, when Paul says, in all circumstances, take up the helmet of salvation, it's almost like he's a coach. And he's getting real in your face and saying, don't you know that we live life with a helmet on? You see, most of our battles against the enemy are not our circumstances. They're not our situations. It's actually a battle in the mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. But it doesn't mean we don't wage war. We just fight with different weapons. They're not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And just in case you don't know what a stronghold is, Paul continues, we demolish arguments. It's the way we think. Every pretension, the way we think, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, if we truly desire to be strong in the Lord, if we want to walk in victory in our day-to-day -day lives, we must wear a helmet. In all circumstances, take up the helmet of salvation. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've read Ephesians 6 easily in the hundreds of times in my life. Maybe not an exaggeration to say in the thousands. But what's amazing about the Word of God is it's more than a book. The Word of God is living and active. And being living and active, God will speak to us, no matter how many times we've read a passage, no matter how many times we've gone through it, no matter how well we think we know it, if we open our hearts and mind, God is gonna speak to us. And of all the times that I have read Ephesians 6, I don't think I've ever really seen the words in all circumstances, in all situations of life. When the circumstances of your life feel wonderful and great and when they feel sorry and bad, when you are feeling on top of the mountain spiritually or when you feel like you are in a valley, when your schedules are chock full of activity and you don't feel like you have any space whatsoever and when you feel like you have moments to breathe in your daily schedule, in all circumstances, what? Take up the helmet of salvation. In all circumstances means 24-7. All day, every day. Now, I know if you've been around Beltway Park over the past couple of years, we've talked a lot about the mind. We spent last fall on a spiritual growth journey. We're gonna have another one um, this fall about something different. But we talked about minds and changing the way we think and taking on the mind of Christ. We call it flip the script. And if you want to learn more about that and you miss it, I would go back and revisit some of those things. But from these three words, in all circumstances, I feel like the Lord gave me a truth that I want to resound inside of us and I, I want to challenge you with. In all circumstances says, the intentional practice of God focus empowers victory. That's why I ask the question, how often in a given day do you think about God? See, I asked that question of myself this week and I didn't really like the answer. It's amazing how big the gaps can be how large they can be in life. It's why I ask, could something so seemingly innocuous as distraction, so seemingly harmless as lack of focus, could it be a scheme of the enemy? I remember one time I was playing golf. I don't play golf much at all. And I was playing golf with one of our elders who's gone to be with the Lord. And um, I'd hit the ball, he watched me for a little while, he said, David, I, you need to change some things. I said, dude, I need to change a lot to tell you the truth, but I don't care that much. He said, well, let me give you one little hint. I said, okay, he said, move your feet. I said, okay, how far? And he said, move them just like a couple of inches. I'm like, dude, a couple of inches isn't gonna save my golf game. And he's saying, it's a start. And I said, it's just a couple of inches. He said, but think about it. If you hit the ball just a couple of inches off and you happen, by the grace of God, to hit it straight that one time, um, the further it goes, the further off course it's gonna get. It's not, it, it's not that it's that big a deal. If you duff it and you're just a few feet in front, you're not gonna be that far off. But if you happen to hit it and it goes like 200 yards, and it's just off a few inches at the beginning, the further it travels, the further it gets from where you want it to be. 
Could distraction, the lack of attentional focus, be the same thing? Could it be we start just a little bit, but the further we walk, the further we get away from it? Now, I know it could be easy for you just to dismiss me right now and say, Pastor, I, I, like, I, I will live in the real world. I work more than one day a week. It's not like I haven't heard that joke before. I don't get to sit around all day, every day, and just think about God. Now, believe it or not, I know you think if you work in the church that it's gonna create automatic God focus. I can tell you after having 35 years of being employed by a church, unequivocally, it does not do that. In fact, it's this weird thing because we're kind of around God talk all the time. And because you're around God talk, you think you're thinking about God. You think you're focused on God when reality you're not. The enemy is there as well. I'm just telling you, if you will trust me, we are all in the same boat right now. But this isn't new to us, it's always been the case. The book that I think talks about spiritual warfare, the reality of our unseen battle, as much as any other book in the Bible except Ephesians, is actually the Old Testament book of Daniel. Now if you've been around the church, as soon as I said the word Daniel, you think of two stories we tell our kids all the time, great stories. One, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a fiery furnace, Jesus meets them in the furnace, they are saved. And Daniel, Daniel, he is thrown into a den of hungry lions, but God shuts their mouths and he is rescued. We know those stories if you've been around the church. Here's my question. Do you remember why Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? Believe it or not, it has to do with intentional focus. Let me give you the scenario real fast. A couple of hundred years before Daniel, Israel has a civil war, divides into two, two nations. The northern nation actually retains the name Israel, the south takes on the name Judah. Both nations struggle with following God wholeheartedly. Israel in the north far more than Judah in the south. God sends prophets, he warns them. They don't pay attention to him until eventually God withholds his hand of protection over them and allows nations to come against them to overtake them, not to destroy them, but to awaken Israel to their need of him. This happened to Israel in the north in 721 B.C. It happened to Israel, uh, Judah in the south in 586 B.C. You got the dates? We'll test next week on that, okay? Um, 20 years prior to Judah in the south being destroyed, Babylon had already kind of begun to oversee it. A guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar comes into Israel and takes a massive number of young leaders out of Israel and takes them back to Babylon. That was the practice of the Babylonians. Every nation they began to oversee, they would take the best young leaders, would take them and would train them in the courts of the king. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are three that actually had this happen to them. So if you read the book, and I strongly encourage you to do it, what you find is amazing is this. Daniel, though he is from another nation, he is not Babylonian, later on he's not Persian, he becomes part of the inner circle, the court of advisors of four emperors. Now let that sink in for a minute. The four most powerful men on planet Earth at that time, Daniel somehow by the favor of God ends up being one who can give them counsel about God and truth. It's amazing some of the things he shared with them. Just a side note. If you think God has abandoned the nations of the earth and everything about leadership is godless, just hear me. I suspect God has a Daniel or an Esther among every leader of the world. They're not gonna advertise it, they're not gonna shout, but I'm just telling you, God is seeking to influence. He is seeking to work. Daniel was one of those under the third emperor, not a Babylonian, but a Persian by the name of Darius. Daniel actually becomes the most trusted advisor. Daniel, who was Jewish, not Pers uh, Persian, becomes the go-to guy for Darius, and that causes all the other advisors, most of whom are Persian, it causes them to be jealous. They don't like this reality. So they manipulate Darius through his pride and through an interesting law of the Medo and Persians you can read about in the book of Daniel. They set Daniel up for failure. Why did they do this? Because they were jealous of him. And they knew Daniel had a practice a habit that he wasn't gonna stop no matter what they did because they manipulated Darius to create a law that everyone in the kingdom of Persia had to pray only to Darius. And the Bible says in Daniel 6, when Daniel knew the document to pray only to Darius had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in the upper chamber open towards Jerusalem, where the temple would be. He got down on his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God. This is the key phrase. 
as he had done previously, as he had always done. So really see this, at at risk of his life, Daniel refused to quit the intentional practice that enabled him to focus on God. Now I know some of you are thinking, well that must be what God commanded, hear me. Nowhere in the law does God command you pray three times a day. So this is not commanded, this is not demanded by God. Why would Daniel risk his life? He knew reality, he knew that if he lost focus on God, he would fail and fall in this godless land. So think about it, connect it to our lives. Don't you find that one of the hardest things we do as Christians is to really stay focused on God? You know exactly what I'm talking about. If if you decide tomorrow morning, which I encourage you to do, you're gonna wake up 15 minutes earlier than normal, and you're gonna get 15 minutes to start your day with God, you will have a more difficult time getting up tomorrow morning than you have any other day in the past three or four months. It is our reality, or you decide to come to church. I can't tell you how many families tell me the hardest day to get our family rolling. Even though we go to church later than we go to school, the hardest day it seems is when it's Sunday and you need to go to church. When it's Thursday, it's time to go to service. Or when you do engage scripture, you open it up and your mind just begins to run. Run. You start to pray. It's like a hard time keeping focus. I know it seems extreme, but doesn't it seem like there are forces that are trying to keep us from focusing on God? Here's my challenge. I think there is. The enemy knows that without focus, we will be powerless to join him in what he is doing in the world. We're gonna be powerless to bring life to our families, powerless to bring his kingdom to our friends, to bring his will to those in need. And he knows this, if he can create distraction in our lives, I know it starts really small, But if we keep walking in that way of distraction, just like the golf shop, we're gonna find ourselves far away from our source of encouragement, source of strength, source of power. We will be more and more vulnerable to his attacks. See, I know you think, no, no, no. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they lived in a different world. They just lived from one miracle to another miracle to another miracle to another miracle. Wrong! We know of two miracles, one in each of their lives. The rest of it, listen to me, they lived a hard life. They were exiles. Daniel, though he experienced one grand miracle, Daniel, as far as we know, never saw his family again. He was taken likely as a young teenager, never saw his family again, never worshiped in his local church again, probably never worshiped in a church again. It might be that the Jews gathered and have some worship, but it's unlikely in, the, in Babylon and in Persia that they allowed that to happen. He never got to go to the temple again in his life. I'm not trying to be crass here, but it is highly likely that Daniel was castrated. That would have been the normal practice for someone like Nebuchadnezzar bringing someone into his courts. He would have turned all his advisors into eunuchs. So when you read all those Old Testament genealogies, you know those lists of he beget he who beget he who beget he, and you wonder why it's in the Bible. It's a big deal, we'll talk about why it's in the Bible in a later date. But what you're gonna find in all those genealogies, no Daniel. He had no wife. He had no sons to carry on his name, which is huge in the Jewish world. And beyond that, every day he had to go to school. And he was trained systematically in the philosophies, ideologies, and theologies of first the Babylonians and then the Persians. And all he had was a remembrance of what he grew up with in the synagogues and the temple way back in the days in Jerusalem. Listen to me, Daniel's life was far from easy. If anyone had reason to question God, be mad at God, to doubt God, it was Daniel. But here's what you see through the entire book. Daniel stood strong. Daniel lived in victory in the most godless of lands. Daniel stood strong because he had a practice, and that practice was he was just every day gonna keep his attention on God. Every day he was gonna somehow pull away and he was gonna stay connected, stay focused on God. If I may, in all circumstances, he made sure he wore the helmet of salvation. What if, hear me, what if we got radical and we did the same? What if we just looked at our lives and said, what what if we did something similar to that? See, I think it's far more possible than we think it is. We live in a world of distraction. 
There is so much information and data being published, and by published, I mean out on the internet. Do you know that in the year 2022, there'll be more data, more information published than in all of human history, meaning the beginning of time to the year 2000? One year, more information, and they project it will double in 2023. And not only is all that information out there, there are very creative people doing very creative things to try to get you and I to look at, to read, to somehow engage what they have created. We live in a world with thousands of thousands of voices, and what do they say? Look at me. Watch me. Listen to me. I have what you need. And I'm not saying that all those things are evil. What if the enemy's just using all the voices to distract? And the longer that we're distracting from that which is most vital, the more vulnerable we become to the attacks of the enemy. See, I would challenge just like Daniel, if you wanna live life with a helmet on, you gotta be just as intentional as he. So my question for you, how are you gonna do it? For me, I'm gonna take a strategy from Daniel. I figured the boy pulled, somehow pulled aside three times a day to pray, could I do something similar? Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I tend to be a bit competitive. So I looked at Daniel and said, Daniel went three? What if I went four? And I somehow pulled aside and I felt like the Lord gave me an idea. This is just me. So each morning when I get up, almost every morning, I wake up and the first thing I wanna do is say, good morning, God. That's gonna become a habit, that's not normal for me. Now I'd like to say that I could just jump right into like three hours of prayer, not me. I'm not there, like I'm barely going, I'm headed to the coffee pot. And normally what I do is do a few things to get awake and then I start to engage. I read my Bible, I have a Bible reading program that I go through, I'm usually reading a book that's helping me grow spiritually in an area and sometimes I read that in the morning, sometimes I don't. And then I spend some time praying. Now listen to me, it is not hours, but it's more than a handful of minutes. I do that, but then I had this idea. After that time of prayer, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull out this thing called a phone. You know what one of those are? Most of us have one. I'm gonna pull out my phone and I'm gonna look at my schedule. And twice during the day, I am going to set my alarm. Once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Now I can't have it just recurring the same time because my schedule changes every day. And it would be awkward like if my schedule was normally at 9.55 on sun, um, in the morning and my phone was going off in my pocket and the alarm was happening, etc. But I can adjust it for today, which I've already done. Now I'm just gonna set an alarm in the morning and an alarm in the afternoon. And when that alarm goes off at a time that I know I can turn my attention, I'm gonna take just a handful of minutes. See, I think we believe that when it says Daniel got down on his knees and faced Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, we think he spent hours doing it. And since we can't spend hours doing it, we might as well not do anything. But the text doesn't say he spent hours. What if he just got down on his knees and said something like, my father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And that prayer takes less than one minute. I don't know what Daniel did. I just know that I've already started doing it this week and I'm amazed at how shocked I am when my alarm goes off. Like, like I said it that morning, I knew I was gonna be preaching on it and I was really excited about it. And like my alarm went off on Tuesday morning at 10 and I like jumped. What's going on? Oh yeah! Isn't that what life is like? Life just has that way of we're going. We're going, we have all this, we have activities, we have schedules, we have things to do. What if we just took some time? He said, Dave, what are you gonna do? I, I don't know. I'm gonna give thanks to God for what he's done. I'm gonna give praise to God for who he is. I might make a declaration based upon some things I want God to get in our lives. We give you declarations for all of our sermons. You can make that declaration. Um, I might meditate a little bit on a passage that I read that morning in the scripture. There's all sorts of things I can do. It doesn't matter. I'm just gonna take a few minutes. I'm not talking about hours. I'm just gonna take a few minutes where I have a moment and I'm gonna turn my attention towards God and be focused on him. Then at night, the way I normally go to sleep is I usually am reading a book. Before I start reading the book, because I'm gonna fall asleep when I start reading the book. Before I start reading the book, I'm gonna take a few moments. Just give my sleep to the Lord. Give my rest to the Lord. Ask him to speak to me in dreams and visions. I don't get a lot of those. I get dreams, but they're odd dudes, man. There's no way they can be from God. 
but he can. And I'm just inviting him in, making declarations, probably my favorite declaration. So I go to sleep, Psalm 127, unless you, O oh God, build a house, I will labor in vain if I try to build it. Unless you watch over the city and you watch over my family, I will stand guard in vain if I try to do it. In vain, I will rise up early and stay up late, toiling to make things happen. But you grant sleep and rest. And so I declare I will rest as one who knows that you're watching my city and you're building my, my, my walls. There you go. You got one. And I make a declaration. I give thanks for what he's done in the day. Pray about some of the things happening. You get what I'm saying? And then I do that every day. Now, I know what you're thinking. Dude, that's way too simple. If I'm going to listen to you, you're going to have to start thinking more deeply than that, right? And we think simple is insignificant. But all the text said was Daniel went and had a place and he purposed to pray three times a week, three times a day. And that gave him a strength in the midst of a land I would challenge far more godless than our land, far more distracting than our land. And that focus gave him a strength with which he lived this life. Listen to me. Simple can be significant. Think about it. Some of the most creative people in our culture want to get your attention. And you know what they came up with? An alert on your phone. Everybody wants to do an alert. Alert, alert, alert. Some of you, bless you, you got all those alerts turned off. I just challenge you to turn all those alerts off. You can look at it later if you want to. But what if we just took a page from that strategy, which really goes back to Daniel, all you're doing is creating your own alert but you're doing an alert with a purpose to be who God has made you to be. I want the habit of intentional focus in my life because the practice of intentional focus, you know what it does? It empowers victory. The scripture says you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, focused, fixed on you because that man, that woman trusts in you. I am telling you right now, I don't know that I've had perfect peace much in my life. I think I've had moments where I tasted it. I would like more moments of perfect peace, and it comes to the one whose mind is stayed, fixed, focused on the Lord. I unashamedly want it. In all circumstances, what do you do? Take the helmet of salvation. But here's what I've learned over the years. You ready? A good idea is only a good idea unless we do something real intentional and make it happen. That which brings strength in life must be purposed. You gotta make it intentional. It doesn't just happen. If you need life and strength in your physical body and you know that you have to change some habits, you're gonna have to make it intentional. Like if you need to change your diet, sometimes what you gotta do is you gotta cleanse the pantry of all that which would oppose you and stand against you, right? Because in that moment of weakness, that's where you run, baby. Me and little Debbie, we've got through a lot in life together. <laughs> little Debbie likes to stay around, you know what I'm saying? You gotta purge the world. And if you wanna exercise, you gotta purpose it. And it takes a season to develop a habit. So let's develop the habit. Probably gonna take you 21 to 60 days to build a habit. And at some point it becomes more automated in your life. I think it's worth it to build a habit of intentional focus. So let me brash to ask you a question. It's real simple. North Campus, South, online, everyone. What do you think God might be leading you to do so you can be God focused in all circumstances? What you do doesn't have to look anything like what I do because your world day to day may look a lot different than my world. But my gut tells me that in all of our worlds, we have moments that we can purpose to turn our attention to God's, no matter what we're doing, no matter who we are. If we would just be intentional about it, we can do it. What are you gonna do? I just stole a page from Daniel. You're willing to steal the page from Daniel on my page and you can adjust it, amend it, massage it, do whatever you need with it. There may be something else. It doesn't matter. Just what plan are you gonna have so you're gonna be God-focused in all circumstances? I'm just gonna tell you now, if you say, I just need to be more God-focused, I commit to that, it will not happen. You are going to have to commit to a practice 
to do something to help you develop a habit. And then I think before long, we're going to find it bringing life and bringing joy and bringing peace. And we're going to want to do it more. And we're going to want to do it more. And then we're going to find that I'm taking up the helmet of salvation in all circumstances. Be purposeful. Be intentional. Now, one additional thing I would tell you to do, listen to me. I would tell you that of all the things we do around here at Beltway Park, one of the things that would help you do this, be focused in all circumstances, is to be part of community. We call them groups. I've been part of a small group for 45 years of my Christian. I've been in a small group every bit of my Christian journey. I'm in a group now. Our group, like many Beltway groups, has not been meeting in the summer, and I found how much I missed my group because in the time of our God-focused conversation, things are said by group members that stir me. I mean, you know, it's a little awkward because my group's talking about my sermon. Um, and they love me, but they're honest. And they tell me stuff. But what's amazing to me is they'll say something that God brought to their mind while I was preaching. I've really threatened that I am going to preach the sermon, have my group before I preach it to you. I'm going to preach it to them first so I can get all the ideas that God's given them, and then I can preach it because there's some incredible stuff. And what happens is that gets me thinking. It gets me focused on stuff. I'm just telling you, we need that in our life. We are going to be launching a spiritual growth campaign the second week of September. We're going to be giving you an opportunity in a few weeks to be part of a group. I'm telling you, you need to say right now, I need to be part of one. We need community where we have God-focused conversation about life. I encourage you to do that. But to have that happen, we need some groups. And I am confident God is stirring some of you to host a group for an eight-week period of time. So I'm just going to tell you, unashamed, I need some of you to talk to us about that. Some of you who will say, yeah, maybe I'll step away from my group or two or three of us from our group will go and we'll start another group because we can invite other people in because we want everyone to be part of one of these groups. I need some of you who are willing to do it. So here's what I'm asking you to do. If you're willing to talk to us, I'm not saying commit to it. I'm saying willing to talk to us. I want, I want to convince you we will make it easy on you. I'm not going to say it's without any kind of stretching, but we'll make it easy because you don't have to worry about what you're going to teach because there's no teaching. We're going to give you all sorts of information that you can use in your group. We have children's ministry that's available at different times. We're going to give you training about how groups are facilitating, facilitating stuff. We will do all that. All we need you to say, I'm willing to talk to you. And the way you do that, inserting your park news is fill that out and you can take it to the kiosk at our south campus in the south foyer, at the north campus in the foyer, or you can just use that QR code. Use that picture, fill it in, and all you're saying is, I'm willing to talk to you. No commitment yet. Let us talk to you about what it takes to lead a group and just know you're needed. Because here's what we need. We need, we believe for this fall campaign, we feel like we need 500 groups. Now, we have hundreds of groups, but we need some more. And so some of you are being called to step out, and here's what you're doing. You're actually facilitating an opportunity for people to have some radical God focus that can spur them on in their week. It's an incredible thing you're doing. So I'm asking you, if you're willing to do it, man, step out, talk to us about it, okay? The intentional practice of God focus empowers victory like few things. So I'm gonna ask everyone to bow their heads for a moment. And I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what do I need to do? And maybe you don't know what you need to do yet, but were you willing to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to do something to get you focused in my life and by this time, give yourself 24 hours, 48 hours, and say, I'm going to start a practice. Maybe the Lord showed you something you need to do. Maybe you want to take on something similar to what Daniel did, what I'm going to do. Man, say, yes, Lord. But you got to start it. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to make a mistake. I missed Thursday. Just flat forgot. And then I was preaching Thursday night and I remembered I didn't do what I said I was going to do um, today. And what some of us do is we let perfection be the enemy of progress. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to forget a day. Just start again the next day. Do it the next day. Overcome the mistakes. And some of you right now, you know you got to be in a group. Some of you have been in a group. You know it's value, but you kind of moved away from it. You need to step back in. Just say yes to it now. You got it? Father, we lay hold of your promise. You keep in perfect peace the man or the woman whose mind is steadfast on you, stayed on you, fixed on you, 
We want grace to do that. We live, oh God, in a world of distraction, but the world's always been that way. We live in a world where the enemy is trying to move us away from seeing you and knowing you. We just ask simply, oh God, to give us a strategy for our lives right now. I pray that you would impart to each man and each woman a strategy of what they need to do. Encourage to live that out. Change a practice in our lives that we might be those who in all circumstances put on the helmet of salvation and we keep our eyes, our heart fixed on you. That's what we want, oh God. Give us grace for it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.